you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is quite an extraordinary venue to have the opportunity to speak in. There is, of course, a certain mischievousness in, in our being here, but really, it's not our fault that the left wants to pretend this history didn't happen, and we have to dig it out and show Americans that it really did. Let me first thank, though, the Tenth Amendment Center and also the other major sponsor of the event, WeRefuse.com. These two organizations have put on this tour with almost no major media help. This whole topic that we're talking about tonight involving state nullification is being totally ignored by people who are supposedly great patriots on the radio and television, and they're always patting themselves on the back for how willing they are to stand up to the left. But when it comes to this subject, crickets. Not a word, nothing. Now, there are a few honorable exceptions to that. One of them, of course, on television, the only honorable exception, the only person even to talk about this, is Judge Andy Napolitano. We know he's here. He's one of the few non-phonies we have on TV, so that's, that's welcome. On the radio, just the other day, uh, substituting for Rush Limbaugh, Walter Williams was urging state It was a real coup to get a, a Walter Williams blurb on the back cover of Nullification. Man, that made me feel good. Right, that's great. But Walter Williams, I mean, he, he is fearless. He does not care what they say about him. I don't care what you say about me. I'm right. <laughs> I'm right. I'd rather be right. And the other two are not as well known, but uh, again, among sort of the, the upper tiers of radio hosts, Jerry Doyle has been favorable, and Mike Church has been favorable. Now there's a name, now, now that's good, there's a smattering of applause, but there should be thunderous cheers. I want to introduce you to Mike Church. Well, he's not actually here, I mean, you know, metaphorically. But um, Mike Church is on a Sirius XM satellite radio, 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern, so he's the drive time guy, every day, Monday through Friday. And I think he is the best radio host because he's knowledgeable and he's funny and it's not a put on like the guy who's on the radio is the real guy you actually meet. It's not some phony baloney persona he's putting on. And he's so good. He, you, you, you've got to listen to this guy. Now, because I'm never awake that hour because I'm in a different time zone. So it's like the middle of the night for me. But when I'm heading to the airport early morning, I put on Mike Church and in my daze and stupor, he, he makes sure I get to the airport without swerving off. And, that's a, that's a service in and of itself. What we're doing here tonight is urging people to, and I hate this expression, to think outside the box. What box do I mean? Well, I mean the box that they've tried to stuff us into for I don't know how long, where the New York Times is going to tell us what the range of allowable opinion is. You can have this opinion, or, if you want to be a real extremist, you can have this opinion that's one and a half inches to the right of you. And anywhere in that area, right around here, you'll be acceptable and, and we'll treat you fairly and not smear and condemn you. But if you happen to think that maybe some of the answers to the problems of our society are to be found outside the box that goes from Joe Biden to Bob Dole, well, you're obviously an enemy of mankind who deserves to be smeared and destroyed in the media. And we need to break out of that box, but it's not enough to break out of that box. The box needs to be crushed into the ground and then set on fire. Now, one of the things I've been doing for years now is I specialize in writing books that contain things you did not learn in class, unless you were in my class, in which case I assigned my own books. What, what, was, what was tenure for, after all, if not to force your books on the hapless student body? By the way, the one consolation, a lot of people say, gosh, our young people don't read these days. It's terrible, they just don't read. But here's the one consolation. Sure, they don't read their textbooks in college. Well, that means their heads aren't filled with fallacies. Which, the, the reason that's a good thing is, in the old days, I have a professor friend at Auburn who says in the old days, he's, he teaches economics, 
Students would come into the, his classroom, their heads would be filled with these fallacies, and he would have to spend his first class session refuting all the fallacies. He says, now they come in, I have to teach them the fallacies, and then refute the fallacies. <laughs> So yes, it is true that a lot of these kids' minds are blank slates. I'd rather have a blank slate than a, well, I was going to say a bad word, kind of slate. But that's an effect of what we've got, is that when I've talked to a lot of young people, yeah, look, they haven't gotten a particularly good education, they don't remember any of this stuff. And so they are willing to listen. The people who aren't willing to listen are those who have allowed their minds to be formed by the so-called establishment over the decades that has told them what they're allowed to think. That has got to be attacked vigorously. Now, I'm happy to say that we are starting to see some fruits, despite the fact there's been a complete blackout on this subject, a blackout. Even though this is going on, we see state legislatures pursuing this around the country. We see them saying to the federal government, we're not going to do X, Y, or Z. We're starting to see this. And again, it's like this isn't even happening. This is no mention of it, uh, nothing, no, no talk about it at all. And yet, as I say, we're seeing fruits anyway because a lot of you folks, and a, some of you people are Campaign for Liberty, some of you are 912, some are Tea Party, some are other organizations. But the point is, what you share in common is that you don't believe the New York Times, you don't believe the TV, you trust people who have a track record of telling you the truth. And you spread the word about things. You hand out copies of books to friends. You forward articles to people. You send YouTubes to people. You get around the gatekeepers of established opinion, and that's how we've gotten this message out there. We haven't gotten any help with it, except from ourselves. Now, what's been going on? Well, I'll just give you a couple brief points here quickly. Some of you probably know about an interesting development. Now, it ultimately didn't work out, but it was the first try. In Idaho recently, the, the Idaho... House of Representatives introduced a nullification bill aimed at the federal health care law. And this bill was preceded by hearings that were held at the State House. Nullification hearings. I mean, when, when has this happened in U.S. history recently or ever? They actually had hearings on the subject. Hundreds of people from Idaho showed up to put pressure on the legislators to make clear this is where we stand, we support this. And the measure passed the House 49 to 20. Now, I happen to see that the ABC station in Boise did a little report saying, and again, I hope you don't think I'm some crazy ego case, but I have to tell you, so this doesn't happen to me a whole lot, so I have to tell you what it does happen. They did this report, and the report begins, a book is having influence here in Idaho, particularly in the state. Our reporter so-and-so reports. And then they go to the reporter. She's saying, well, this is the book right here. And I'm watching this. Somebody said to me, I can't believe this is happening. And so sure enough, they interview the, uh, one of these state legislators who said, you know, you know, a lot of us have read it. We've been influenced by it. And I tried to give the governor a copy, but he refused because he said he already had one and he'd already read it. What am I, living in the twilight zone? This doesn't happen to me. <laughs> and, and in fact, the governor said to the legislature, I want you to do this. I am urging you to do this. I, I, I can't get over this. There's a state, I can't mention the name now because I, I don't want to jinx it, but it's already been lined up. 44 organizations in this particular state. It's a sizable state. 44 organizations, some of the big group, big tea parties and also Concerned Women for America, big organizations, co-signed a letter to the legislative leadership of this state saying, we urge you to meet with Tom Woods to talk about state nullification as a remedy in our state. I mean, it's incredible. So we've, we've scheduled this meeting. It'll take place later this month. Again, how is that happening? Again, think of any major TV host who claims to be right of center, other than the judge. How many of them have talked about this? Zero. And yet somehow, it's going on anyway. I don't understand how this is happening. Like, I'm right in the center of this thing. I have no idea how this is happening. But it's happening, and it's one of the most encouraging things I've ever seen, precisely because it flies so directly in the face of established opinion. Now, let me give this the quick, brief, 
case, very quick case for state nullification. And the reason I'm going to give a quick case for it is that I have a, a whole lot of YouTubes on this subject. So I, I always, every time I come out and speak, I've got some group that's already seen every YouTube I've ever done. I always feel like, well, I can't. It's like a comedian. You know, a stand-up comic has it really hard in the age of YouTube. What, do I have to write all new material every night? It's very hard on a stand-up comic. It's easier for me as a historian, but I don't want to bore people with the same old stuff. But basically, the argument runs as follows. First of all, the states came before the union. Now, you would think that would be obvious, right? Like the bride and groom came before the marriage. Like these sorts of things should be obvious. You can't have the marriage first and then the marriage creates the bride and the groom. The bride and groom create the marriage. Well, likewise, the union of states is created by the state. It had to be states first before you can have a union of states. But it's not just theorizing that leads me to this conclusion. It's the testimony of history. The Declaration of Independence speaks of free and independent states that have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. The British acknowledge the independence not of some single blob, but of individual states, which they then proceeded to name one by one. Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation say, says that the states retain their sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Why would they retain it unless they had it in the first place? So the states, again, begin with the sovereign powers. And when the Constitution was ratified, was it ratified by one giant blob of a vote? No, it was ratified by each constituent part of the Union separately, each state separately. And no state's decision regarding the Constitution could bind any other state. So this, to me, makes clear the status of the states. But now, we have to be careful. Sometimes we speak in shorthand. We talk about state sovereignty. Strictly speaking, this is not correct. In the American system, no government is sovereign. No government is the institution that has the final say. In the American system, it is the peoples of the states that are the sovereigns. So the peoples of the states are the ones who apportion their sovereign powers among the state governments and the federal government. And so therefore, since the peoples of the states are the sovereigns, when the federal government exercises a power of dubious constitutionality on a matter of great importance, it is these sovereigns themselves, the peoples of the states, who are the proper disputants, as they review among themselves whether indeed their agent was intended to have any such power. No other arrangement makes any sense. Nobody asks his agent whether he should have such and such power. You're the one who gave the agent the powers. So the principles to this compact, namely the peoples of the states themselves, they're the ones who ultimately in the last resort have to decide. That's the nature of the system. They were the primordial units of the Union. They came before the Union. They created the Union. So regardless of what other, whatever other types of adjudication systems we may have, ultimately in the final resort, the creators must have the final say. The Frankenstein monster does not tell Dr. Frankenstein what to do. Well, I suppose he does, he tries to because he's big and giant and whatever. That's, but you understand that in the natural order of things, that's not how it works. And in fact, James Madison said this so clearly in his report of 1800. This has just disappeared. But yeah, you can find the report of 1800, but try finding it in a U.S. history textbook, in, in, a, in a history class. Good luck. In that report of 1800, in which Madison defended his views that he had expressed in the famous Virginia resolutions of 1798, he said, look, the ultimate right of the parties to the Constitution, namely the peoples of the states, to judge whether the compact has been dangerously violated, extends to infractions perpetrated by all three branches, whether it's the executive branch violating the Constitution, the legislative branch, or, yes, believe it or not, the judicial branch, too, sometimes betrays us when it comes to interpreting the Constitution. Madison said all three of them can betray us, and all three of them must be subject, in the last resort, to the ultimate tribunal. What is the ultimate tribunal? Why? 
the creators of the union, the parties to the Constitution. Those are his words. Who are they? The peoples of the states. This, in very short <coughs> expression, this is the case for state nullification. Now, one could... Obviously, there's a slightly longer case to be made for state nullification. That's the gist of it. But then we can look to the state ratifying conventions. I've made frequent recourse to the state ratifying convention in Virginia, in Richmond in 1788. And there we see some of the most important Federalists at that convention assuring skeptics of the Constitution, don't worry, if this federal government were ever to try to reach for a power that we haven't delegated to it, Virginia will just be exonerated. Well, 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 that's pretty darn close to what we're saying today, to what we're smeared and condemned as crazy extremists and blah, blah, blah for saying. That's, that's more or less what Patrick Henry was told, was assured. He was assured of this by two figures who later became attorney general, attorneys general, Edmund Randolph and then in Kentucky, George Nichols. These are people who knew a little something about the law, the nature of the Constitution, and they said, don't worry, you'll be exonerated from any additional power the federal government tries to impose on you. So we didn't make this up. This isn't something I made up to, to write a book. I had nothing to do one day, so I invented some doctrine. It's sitting there. It's sitting right there. And again, how many classrooms do we have in which any of this is taught? And certainly, how many law schools do we have? If it's possible for that answer to be a negative number, it would be. <laughs> All right. In fact, any time I'm told, well, now listen, such and such law professor, you know, wants to debate you on something, if I'm debating a historian, I, you know, I always feel like, well, you know, all right, this could be an interesting fight, we'll see who comes up with the winner. But when it's a law professor, again, this is not arrogance on my part, it is cold, miserable experience. When it's a law professor, I, I, I don't worry at all. I, I know he's not going to know anything. And, 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 and when I say that again, I know people who've never heard me before are thinking, this guy, what a jerk, this guy, what do you think he is? But honestly, if you listen to these law professors, here's what they do know. Oh, they know a lot about Supreme Court cases. They've memorized a whole bunch of those. But how much do they know about the Constitution, the state ratifying conventions, which according to both Madison and Jefferson is where you go to find out the real meaning of the Constitution? Like, how much do they know about any of that? Well, I'll be generous and say it's not a lot. It's not a lot. Because they know a lot. They'll say, oh my gosh, such and such Supreme Court justice disagrees with you. Yeah, I don't care. I, I don't live in some bizarro world where Supreme Court justices are demigods before whom I'm supposed to wave incense. Now tonight, the centerpiece of our event is this totally untold story of Joshua Glover. Now here's another figure whose name you won't hear in any textbook. None of us, I will say this, well, I have absolutely no fear of contradiction whatsoever. That not any of us, including me, none of us in this room, when we were being educated, none of us got the Joshua Glover story. It was entirely left out. And yet, you find out that it's actually kind of an important story. Because it shows that state nullification, not only was it not used to defend slavery, I don't know where they're getting this, it was never used to defend slavery. Uh, in, in fact, what federal anti-slavery laws would the South have had to nullify? There weren't any. I mean, they, like, that argument doesn't even make sense. So not only is that not the case, but it was in fact used to fight against slavery. And the state of Wisconsin is quoting verbatim from Jefferson's heroic Kentucky, and, and, uh, Kentucky resolutions of 1798 and 1799, in which the word nullification was used. Nullification is the rightful remedy. This is an astonishing thing, and yet not a word. And all the left-wing smear merchants out there who've spent all their time, instead of actually attacking, I, I, I knew exactly what was going to happen. I write this book, nobody's going to attack the arguments in it. No one. They're just going to say, I'm a bad guy, and oh my goodness, he's outside the box, so don't anybody, everybody block your ears, we can't listen to this, we're not allowed to hear this. All the people who would have fit in perfectly in a job at Providence, they naturally, naturally they respond this way. Nothing from them. Instead, of, instead I'm attacked, you know, I probably support slavery, whatever. How could that possibly be? It doesn't even make sense. They will not even talk about this guy. They won't talk about this event that we're here 
basically remembering this man, this man whose name has been forgotten. It's like he's fallen down the Orwellian memory hole. And if the so-called self-proclaimed champions of the oppressed are going to let him languish down there, then it's our job to rescue him. And that's what we're doing here. Now, you do hear this a lot. And our previous speaker emphasized this. That you do hear, if you support the states doing anything against the federal government, well, you know, what does that mean? You probably want to bring slavery back. Uh, you probably, I mean, you know, in all seriousness, they're saying idiotic things like this. Uh, you probably want to oppress people. You, 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 you're probably a so-called neo-confederate, which is one of these uh, sort of uh, Marxian agitprop terms they use to smear people with. I don't even know what it means. But I mean, talk about fighting a battle of wits against an unarmed man. Because <laughs> on the eve of the Southern Secession, and when Jefferson Davis is, Jefferson Davis is uh, giving his farewell speech to the U.S. Senate, he's denouncing nullification. Hello? How is this neo-Confederate? The president of the Confederacy is upset about nullification. Or we have the fact that South Carolina lists as one of its grievances that it's sick and tired of the North nullifying so much. How is this a neo-Confederate teaching? It's an American teaching. It's neither Northern nor Southern. It is American. In fact, this very state of Ohio, in 1820, did you know your state legislature passed a resolution affirming the statement that a majority of Americans accept the principles of 98 according to which the states, the peoples of the states, must stand in judgment of unconstitutional federal laws. That was Ohio. I don't think Ohio is part of the Confederacy. I mean, maybe you're, you know Ohio history better than I do. Again, this is all gone. This is not out there. Thanks to YouTube, we can get this information out there, but this is just gone. It's like it never even happened. I made a video that some of you may have seen, but others of you, if you haven't seen, this is the one favor I'm going to ask you tonight. And that favor is, I want you to visit a website called, and, and please commit this to memory, interviewwithazombie.com. <laughs> yes, I purchased that domain name, the best seven bucks I ever spent. <laughs> interviewwithazombie.com is where you can find, first of all, if you've seen the video, check out interviewwithazombie.com anyway, because then you can also see the blooper tape, which turns out to be 50 times funnier than the original video. But the idea of the video was, I knew what was going to happen to me. I knew my name's going to be smeared, we're going to drag through the mud, and we have all these attacks, you know, we've got to deal with all this. I knew that was going to happen. But I thought, I'm going to launch a preemptive strike. Because I've got YouTube. So the premise of interview with a zombie is that a zombie has his own television talk show. Yeah, I know how different that is from our real television, right? <laughs> So he interviews authors, he's interviewing me, and the idea is he can only utter one-word responses. So I'm sitting there giving substantial answers to his inquiries, I'm giving facts, on and on. But all he can do is just point a finger and, and say, neo-confederate, or racism, or slavery. And each time we go through and say, actually the exact opposite is true. He doesn't know what to do, so he just goes back to throwing out the names. Just more name calling. So the idea is that this is how a zombie would interview me. So this is how, when now, anytime I'm attacked, and people use these same arguments, or they attack nullification, the, the principle, and they say, oh, this is some crazy neo-confederate view, the word neo-confederate has now become so laughable because of this video that people immediately, they go to the comments section, and they type in, zombie! You're a zombie! How, you know, raising these arguments, claiming that we're this or we're that, or calling us names and refusing to engage the arguments themselves. And these poor people who are launching these really vicious attacks on nullification, they don't know what hit them. Because everybody who's watching this video is calling them a zombie because they're conforming exactly to what I expected would happen. The merits are not going to be considered. It's that this is not allowed. It's not part of that box. So we have to smear and condemn anybody who supports it. Now, meanwhile, the progressives, so-called, I don't know how they got that name, but the progressives, you remember, remember the old days when pro progressives had this slogan, question authority, remember that? Remember those days from like long, like it seems like three lifetimes ago? 
Because now their slogan is, shut up and obey. <laughs> so much for question authority. Remember another, another progressive slogan was, small is beautiful. Right? We don't need these giant corporations. Small is beautiful. We don't need agribusiness. Small is beautiful. Now, you know, to some degree, I'm all for that. But whatever happened to small is beautiful? How come small is beautiful doesn't apply to politics? How come 309 million people being infallibly governed by one city, that's just the right size? Like, th these people, their philosophy doesn't even make any sense, and these are the ones who are coming after us the most vigorously. And yet, what I want to suggest to them is that if they were real progressives, they would in fact stand with us. Because look at what it is we've got to choose from here. Before the modern period, before a couple centuries ago, political life was not organized the way it is today, where one irresistible central authority governs everybody, and that's just the end of it. Just there's one flat plane, a bunch of individuals being governed by an infallible central authority. No, 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 that is not how liberty came to Europe. The old style, style of political organization was that there wasn't just one infallible central authority running society, and we, we've all been led to believe that's the only way society can be organized. No, you had a, a patchwork of competing jurisdictions whose symbiotic relation yielded you the society. And so you had universities that had their own privileges that couldn't be uh, invaded, and towns that had their own hard-fought, hard-won privileges that couldn't be invaded. And the church had its privileges, and various classes had their privileges, and the guilds. And you had all these little interlocking groups, each one of which had liberties it was prepared to defend, and which no king dared to override. And that was how society functioned, with these things harmoniously working together. Not with one infallible authority dictating to every institution in society. And then we get the modern period, particularly the French Revolution. The French Revolution dramatically overturns this. In fact, one of the great French revolutionaries said, France is not a collection of states. The whole revolution is lost if we concede this. France is a single whole. That is the principle of the modern unitary state. There is one single whole, it infallibly governs all the lesser bodies, and all these lesser bodies don't have inherent liberties. They have whatever the central authority chooses to dish out to them, and nothing more. That's the system that the Founding Fathers tried to avoid by giving us a Federalist system, and we have allowed it to morph into the nightmare of the French Revolution. And look at the consequences. This institution became responsible for atrocities the likes of which the world had never seen. And indeed, in the 20th century alone, when we think about the scale and scope of the wars that were fought, this would have been unthinkable and impossible in previous centuries. It would have been impossible for the more frugal monarchs of earlier centuries to amass the resources for a World War I with 11 million deaths or to carry out the starvation blockade of Germany, which may have led to three-quarters of a million deaths, the totalitarian revolutions of the 20th century, the genocide, the concentration camps, Siberia, the police states. None of this was possible before the modern state. Not to mention the, the lesser ills, the bureaucracy, the debts that will be impossible to pay. They're going to bring the whole developed world down. And not to mention that these states for all their talk about helping the downtrodden, they can always be counted on to bail out the bigwigs. How in your right mind can you possibly say that nationalism and the modern state have been a progressive force? And that's what they tell us. Now, on this, of course, I've written this book, but I also recommend a resource I put up, statenullification.com where it answers a lot of the objections or links there. You can check out that resource as well. Now, I'm going to take some liberties here up on the stage. They, they left the hook somewhere, like it's out in a truck somewhere, and it's raining, nobody wants to get it. So I'm going to take five more minutes than I'm entitled to, strictly speaking. And I'm sorry, I hope no one else does this. It's really annoying when people do that during the program. But since Michael Bowman didn't hand out a schedule to anybody, you know, for all you know, I'm, I'm sticking to the schedule. But I just want him to know I, I'm aware of it, and I'm sorry. But we all have different reasons for being here. We all have different reasons for being part of this. You know, Michael mentioned people in California, 
uh, you know, who are involved in the medical marijuana thing. That's not everybody's issue. Other people's issue is, um, is gun regulations, and they, and they want to have lo uh, local protection in fighting against unconstitutional gun regulations. Or for other people, it's the economy, or it's local control over agriculture and food, or the FDA is, is, is being overbearing, or, or the EPA, or whatever. Everybody's got something. The genius of Michael Bolden was that he brought it all together and said, you know what, without realizing it, we're actually all part of the same thing. We all share a similar insight, a similar impulse. So some of us have different reasons for being. Now, some people just at, on principle think things should be dealt with on a more local level, regardless of what they are. A lot of us share that principle. But the point is, we've all come here, a lot of us, from different philosophical backgrounds. We've got some, some things in common, but we differ on other things. We've all got our different, different reasons. So I want to just take a couple moments to give you what, what mine. Why am I involved in this nullification thing? It's not just that there's a great constitutional argument for it, and plus it really annoys our overlords in Washington when we adopt a position that they haven't approved for us in advance. So I love doing that, but that's not my main reason. That would be frivolous. Here's basically my main reason. The main reason, is, the main reason I want to try and roll back the federal government is that pretty much it, the federal government, its whole program is based on violence and lies. And the lies are pretty much this. The lies are what we got in the sixth grade. The lies are government is composed of wise, self-sacrificing public servants innocently pursuing the public good. Wherever would we be without these people? Why, we'd be lost. We'd be wandering souls. We'd have no art. Every artist would put down his paintbrush were it not for Joe Biden. <laughs> we'd have no science. We'd probably out all be doing a rain dance or something. We'd all be ignoramuses. We'd all be getting our limbs blown off because our computer monitors would be exploding. Uh, our kids would all be working in a mine for a dollar a day. Society would be run by short men with white mustaches running around carrying sacks of money with dollar signs on them. Now, if there isn't one of us who didn't get that in school. We all got that, but we got it so much that even a lot of us kind of feel like there is a superficial plausibility to that, and there is a superficial plausibility to it. But I'm arguing that, that none of that is true. And in fact, by the way, I'll just mention in passing, that's my new book, Rollback. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying here is that it's not enough to cut the budget. Hard as that will be, we have to cut the propaganda that yielded us this budget. That, oh gosh, we'd be lost without this, lost without that. And I am mercilessly taking a machete to all this stuff we got in school. Because imagine this. Let's imagine kids were not educated by the government, which most of them are. Let's imagine they were educated by Walmart. So every day, kids go to their Walmart school, they sit down in the Walmart classroom, and up on the walls, we have portraits of all the Walmart CEOs. And we sing songs to the Walmart CEOs, and every year we have a special day, they get off from school, where we honor all the great contributions of the Walmart CEOs, without whom we'd all be a bunch of helpless and pathetic boobs. We, wouldn't we suspect there's something creepy about that? We wouldn't believe that. But how come when it's U.S. presidents on the wall, our critical faculties go right out the window. Oh, my good heavens, wherever would we be without about President so and so? No, 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 a thousand times no. No free people should be subject to this. No free people should have so little dignity as to let this version of the story be accepted. And, thank you. But beyond that, we can't afford to believe this anymore. Even if it were true, we can't afford to believe it. Because right now we've got, okay, $1.65 trillion deficit, we've got unfunded liabilities over $100 trillion. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're involved in, we've got a uh, slow motion train wreck going on here. And meanwhile, people want to increase spending on this, 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 and this. It's like, we're, like, like there's some giant pile of cash up on Big Rock Candy Mountain somewhere. <laughs> there ain't no Big Rock Candy Mountain. So, it, so in any event, this is how I'm trying to tie these things together. I believe in nullification, basically because I believe that what nullification is directed against, the institution it's directed against, has put us in such a rotten bind now, has got us in such a spot where in order to, to put things right, we're going to have to undergo some terrible, painful, wrenching changes. And it has, it has allowed 
this to, we've allowed this to go on because we've acquiesced in its growth because we have bought the line, we've bought the story about the federal government. I want to leave you with a story of my own. Uh, it's a story that I'm telling, although it really belongs to uh, Robert Nozick, the Harvard philosopher, late Harvard philosopher. I'm going to tell it quickly. It's called, the, uh, the, it's the tale of a slave, and Nozick tells this in his, in his book, uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. These are my words, but they're Nozick's ideas. It begins with a slave, and it goes through nine stages. They're all quick. I'll be as fast as I can. The first stage, you are a slave at the mercy of a brutal master who forces you to work for his purposes and beats you arbitrarily. The second stage, the master decides to beat you only for breaking the rules and even grants you some free time. Third, you are part of a group of slaves subject to this master. He decides, on grounds acceptable to everyone, how goods should be allocated among you all. Fourth, the master requires his slaves to work only three days per week, granting them the other four days off. They can do as they wish during their free time. Fifth, the master now allows the slaves to work wherever they wish. His main caveat is that they must send him three-sevenths of their wages, corresponding to the three days' worth of work they once had to do on his land every week. In an emergency, he can force them to do his bidding once again, and he retains the power to alter the fraction of their wages to which he lays claim. Sixth, the master grants all 10,000 of his slaves, except you, the right to vote. They can decide among themselves how much of their and your earnings to take and what outlets to fund with the money. They can decide what you are and are not allowed to do. We can suppose for the sake of argument that the master irrevocably grants this right to the 10,000 slaves. You now have 10,000 masters or a single 10,000 headed master. Seventh, you are granted the freedom to try to persuade the 10,000 to exercise their vast powers in a particular way. You still do not have the right to vote, but you can try to influence those who do. Eighth, the 10,000 grant you the right to vote, but only to break a tie. You write down your vote, and if a tie should occur, they open it and record it. No tie has ever occurred. Ninth, you are granted the right to vote, but functionally, it simply means, as in the eighth stage, that in the case of a tie, which has never occurred, your vote carries the issue. Nozick's question is this. At what stage between one and nine did this become something other than the tale of a slave? Now that's an unexamined question because we have come to assume that there must be this one single coercive institution with the power to lay claim on whatever fraction of our income it so decides and without that we'd all, again, we'd all be helpless and so on and on. But what in fact has happened is that this institution, what has it really done to us? What has it done to us? It has pitted us against each other it's pitted us, the farmers take, the education bureaucrats take, the industrialists take, the scientists take, everybody is taking, 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 and we're all engaged in a low intensity civil war with each other. That's what it's done. It's taken a peaceful civil society and done this to us. And in laying claim, in laying claim to the equivalent of, in some cases, five months worth of our labor, or six months, as Nozick says, when the government lays claim to the fruits of five months of your labor, that is not any different from laying claim to five months of your life. This, by any measure, is forced labor. This cannot be the only or most humane way for human beings to interact with each other. Maybe we could all put the guns down instead of looting each other and thinking we're coming out ahead. We're all coming out the poorer. They're getting ahead. The tax eaters get ahead. We get poorer. So what we need to do is set our sights higher, to live better, to live a different way from what we're told in the history books, what we're told in the civics books, and one path to that great outcome is state nullification. And yes, the New York Times won't like it, fashionable opinion won't like it, Newt Gingrich won't like it, I know that. I know that, I'm willing to accept that. We can't let them determine the range of allowable opinion. The federal government, look at how much it's gotten away with by just presenting society with a fait accompli. Hey, look, we did it. We did it, now you just sit back and take it. Why don't we turn the tables? Why don't we do something and let them sit back and take it? Thank you very much.
I, I'm going to be here the whole night. I'll, I'll be locking up the place. Um, so if you wanted to come say hello or whatever, please don't do it now because I want, I want you to hear this program and particularly I want you to hear Jason Rink who's coming up after me. So I'm not going anywhere. We can have, we can chit chat and have drinks and cause trouble later on, but stick around for this. Thanks a lot. Okay.